Every Sunday, before we get into our study in the book of Acts, which happens to be the book we're in right now, we do a prophecy update because we believe that the events that are taking place in the world today are a fulfillment of what the scriptures describe and foretell would be present in the last days before the rapture of the church and then the second coming. We typically focus on and look at Israel. Uh, Israel has been called God's prophetic clock. If you want to know what time it is on God's calendar, just look at the nation Israel. You might say the clock started ticking in uh, May of 1948 when Israel was reborn as a nation by one vote in the UN. And then the clock started speeding up uh, in June of 1967 during the Six-Day War when they captured Jerusalem as their eternal uh, capital. Uh, today we're going to do something a little bit different. We started this last week because the Lord, a number of months ago, has been putting on my heart the significance of the seven feasts that were given to Israel and their prophetic meaning. These seven feasts can be found in a uh, obscure book, the book of Leviticus. This is a book I'm sure we all uh, study often. <laughs> it's sad that we don't. I don't mean to be facetious. Uh, maybe I do mean to be facetious, but you know, the first five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are amongst the most fascinating books in all of the Bible. You know, you hear of the book of Numbers, you think, boring. Nothing could be further from the truth. The book of Numbers is one of the most fascinating books in all of the Bible. There's so much in those books. And not the least of which is the person of Jesus Christ is in the books of the Bible, all the books of the Bible, and even in the books of the Old Testament in the Bible. And this is no exception, as we'll see in uh, this study of these seven feasts. Uh, Leviticus 23, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed feasts, the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. You might say in our day, these were holidays or holy days would be better said. There were seven feasts in all that were given to Israel as appointed times, feasts, if you will, celebrations, if you wish, and these seven feasts, seven the number of completion, not perfection. I think that because the King James has translated this word and made it synonymous, perfection with completion, I think we do err to make them synonymous. It's a different meaning. It's not to necessarily just perfect, but it's to complete. These seven feasts over seven months would complete the prophetic circle, if you will, in pointing Israel to their coming Savior, their coming Messiah. So they were given to Israel over a seven-month period. It began in the spring, and it would continue through and conclude in the fall. Now, these seven feasts have enormous prophetic significance, like we talked about last week, just in the meaning of the name of the feasts in the original language of the Old Testament Hebrew. It's the word mo'ad. That's the same word as in my native tongue of Arabic, mo'ad. It means appointment, to point to an appointed time. In other words, these feasts weren't just to give Israel a day off. They weren't just holidays or holy days to give them, you know, something to look forward to, like we would have Christmas or, you know, Easter. But rather, these would point to not just a time, but a person who would be the fulfillment of that which these moads or feasts would point to. It was a fixed time, a festival where we get feast festival, festival, and it would point Israel to the person of Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at uh, four of these, four of the, of the uh, seven. The first one is the Feast of Passover. And this is simply the Israelites in Egypt about to make their exodus, taking the lamb's blood and putting it on the four posts of their door in the shape of a cross. And the angel of death would 
pass over them. So too with us, because we're in Christ, because of the finished work on the cross, so too does the angel of death, which is the wages of sin, pass over us. And there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So the Passover feast, the Moad, pointed to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the Savior of not just Israel, but the entire world. Now, the second one was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and this pointed to Jesus Christ's burial. Again, they would, in this exodus from Egypt, leave quickly. They were to take bread without leaven. What's leaven a picture of in the Scriptures? Sin. So this unleavened bread was a picture of Jesus' body, which would be buried prior to the resurrection, which is the third feast. And his sin, he w- his body, he would be without sin, just like the bread was without leaven. So again, this pointed to, now after the crucifixion, the burial of Jesus Christ. Then came the feast of first fruits. This pointed to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Excuse me, would take the... Uh, first barley harvest, and the priest would offer it as a wave offering. And again, like we talked about last week, the wave offering was not the the wave, okay? It was like this, in the shape of a cross. Again, pointing to the person of Jesus Christ. And interesting, this first fruits feast, this first fruits celebration was to be celebrated on commemorated on the first day of the week. What a coincidence. (laughs) That just so happens to be when Jesus Christ resurrected, on the first day of the week, which, by the way, is Sunday. This is the first day of the week. Have you looked at calendars lately? Sunday's the first day of the week. Saturday's the seventh day of the week. But this would point to the first day of the week, the first fruits, because Christ's resurrection was the first and the beginning of the first resurrection on the first day of the week. A new beginning, beginning a new week. Now, the church age is what the Feast of Pentecost would point to. This was, if you will, the birth of the church. Now, pent is five. We have what we call the pentagon, the pentagram, the pentateuch. Pent, again, meaning five. Now, this was to be celebrated 50 or five After leaving Egypt, the Jews arrive at Mount Sinai. Now, while there, with fire, they hear the tongue of the Lord, and Moses came down with the law and broke the tablets because of their sin, and 3,000 people died that day. Now, fast forward the clock. Fifty days after the resurrection, the disciples tarry at Mount Zion. There were tongues of fire that came down, the good news of the Lord dying and forgiving the sin of man who broke the law of God was heard, and 3,000 people were saved on that day. And that's what that feast would point to, the Pentecost. And it was the harvest, and that was the harvest. So again, the law is death, but the Spirit is life. When the law came down, 3,000 people died at Mount Sinai. When the Spirit came down on Mount Zion in that upper room, 3,000 people get saved. So that's what we looked at last week were these first four feasts, which would point to and be fulfilled with Jesus Christ's first coming. Now, that's where we pick it up today, and this is the only one we're going to look at in the interest of time. Lord willing, we'll look at the last two next Sunday, but uh, the Feast of Trumpets. This points to... I believe, and many believe, the rapture of the church. Now, keep in mind, the first four feasts were fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. The last three feasts will be fulfilled in Jesus' second coming, and the rapture will be the next thing on God's prophetic clock. Now, some have said, and some believe, that to take the church and have the church be fulfilled in the seven feasts which were given to Israel, you could be guilty of replacement theology. What's replacement theology? By the way, um, we're going to talk today (laughs) about this, and I need for you 
to really ask the Lord to give you the ability to concentrate on that which we're going to be studying today. In school, I used to have a, a teacher that would say, you need to put on your thinking cap. You, you, did, you had the same teacher. <laughs> I used to hate that when they would do that, you know. Um, and then, uh, you know, I would always wonder why. Well, listen, you uh, before we have our potluck today, you're going to be tested on this. So you need to pay attention. No, that's not why. Listen, here's why. We not only need to know what we believe, we need to know why we believe what we believe. See, here's what I don't want to have happen. You're out, you know, talking with non-believers or maybe even believers for that matter, and you're talking about the rapture. And they don't happen to share in your belief that the rapture comes before the seven-year tribulation. Okay? They're, they're entitled to their own opinion. Okay? And they're certainly entitled to be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't very loving, was it? But they'll, they'll find out when we're caught up. We can say, I told you so if we have time. But anyway, here's what I don't want to have happen. I don't want for you to say, no, the rapture of the church happens before the seven-year tribulation. And when they ask you why, you say, because that's what our pastor said. <laughs> no, you need to know why you believe what you believe so that you can give to every man an answer of that hope that lies within you. What's the hope? In the imminent return of Jesus Christ for his church. Now, I've been walking with the Lord since 1982, some 26 years. And early in my Christian walk, I was just a babe in the Lord and, you know, was just learning about all these things, you know, rapture and all this stuff. And I used to be not pre-trib, but, uh, and not mid-trib and really not even post-trib for that matter, but I used to be pan-trib. Have you heard of this theology? Yeah. Pan-trib is it'll all pan out. Yeah. Now, that was okay, but then I realized, you know what? Not only is that not biblical, but that's a little bit dangerous too. See, you sort of gut out the gospel and the urgency of the gospel when you say it doesn't matter. No, it does matter. Because see, the one who longs for his appearing, the one who is watching when the rapture does come as a thief in the night, since no man knows the day or the hour, they won't be kept caught off guard. We'll be waiting. We'll be watching. And in Matthew 24, we have a parable that Jesus gives, and there's two servants that are contrasted in that parable. The one master, the one uh, servant, the wicked servant, says, you know, no hurry, no worry. It'll all pan out. My master will come when he comes, and, you know, there's, there's no need. There's no urgency. And when the master does come, he's caught off guard. And when the master does come, he finds this wicked servant partying. Is that not the greatest success that Satan has had in his campaign to keep people from Christ. One Bible commentator suggests that there was this fictitious meeting in, in hell, and Satan calls all of his demons and says, what are we going to do to keep people from coming to Christ? And one of the demons says, well, let's tell them there's no heaven. Well, Satan responds, that's not going to work because, I mean, the, the creation screams out, cries out, the rocks cry out that there's a God, that there's a creator, that there's a heaven, that there's an earth. Then one demon said, what about there's no hell? He said, well, no, there's something innate within man that, you know, requires justice, requires judgment. So that won't work either. It might work for some, but not for all. Then Satan said, I know what we do. We don't say no heaven. We don't say no hell. We say no hurry. No hurry. See, if I don't believe that the rapture can happen at any time, there's no hurry. See, if I believe the rapture can come at the middle of the seven-year tribulation, then I'll be able to gauge it. I'll be able to know the day and know the hour because it'll be at three and a half years into the seven-year tribulation. And that's not biblical because, see, no man knows the day or the hour. No man knows the day or the hour. So no one can predict when the rapture is going to be. That's by God's design. Well, some say, well, you know, everybody thought the Lord was coming back in their lifetime. Man, my great-grandfather and his great-great-great-grandfather and his great-great-great-grandfather's dog thought it would... I'm not picking on dogs. I love your dogs. But everybody thought it was in their generation. 
by God's design. The apostle Paul thought it was going to be in his lifetime. How about when he writes to the Thessalonian church where we're studying right now in Acts? and says, we who are alive and remain? (laughs) We is he. He's in the we. He thought it would be we, (laughs) that he would be alive. We who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain will meet them in the air. So he thought the rapture was going to be in his lifetime. The disciples thought that the Lord would return in their lifetime. That's why they asked him, what would be the signs of the end of the age and your return in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, the parallel uh, passage. So what's the point? The point is we need to know the doctrine of imminency. What's imminency? It's a big word, isn't it? Imminency is simply in a minute. Yeah, that's the way I remember it anyway, my simple, uneducated, brain-damaged mind. Uh, Jesus could come at any minute. It's imminent. No, we're told in the Scriptures He could come at an hour that you and I don't expect Him to come. Yeah. I'm thinking today would be great. (laughs) How about this afternoon between the hour of 2 and 3? Who is expecting Jesus to rapture His church at the hour between 2 and 3 o'clock p.m. Hawaii Standard Time? Anybody? (laughs) Well, he could come at that time then because that's what he said. I will come at an hour that you don't expect it. Again, by God's design. But we not only need to know why the rapture has to take place before the seven-year tribulation, we need to know that it takes place before the seven-year tribulation, and we need to be able to give an answer as to why we believe that. You can't just say, because that's what I've always been taught. That's what my pastor said to say. Don't do that. If I find out you did that, um, I don't know what we'll do. We'll figure out something, but uh, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> okay, so you have this uh, fifth feast, the Feast of Trumpets. Now, the trumpets they had are not like the trumpets we have today. The trumpets they have was a ram's horn as pictured here, also known as shofar. Now, if you've ever heard a shofar, It is absolutely majestic. I mean, chicken skin. (laughs) I mean, it's just so cool sounding. Well, anyway, they would sound the ram's horn or blow the shofar, and it would have significant meaning. And the Lord appointed this feast of trumpets as a feast for Israel. On the first day of the month of Tishri, On the Jewish ceremonial calendar, the Feast of Trumpets was held. Trumpets were blown together uh, to gather uh, together God's people for a holy convocation, relocation, or confrontation. These trumpet signals had different meanings, and they were for different purposes. So what this means to us is that the Feast of Trumpets is a picture of a holy convocation at the sound of a trumpet for the relocation we call the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and again in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Now, here's what's interesting, and here's where I differ with many well-respected Bible scholars, and as we're going to see in our study of Acts, don't take my word for it. You be a Berean and see if what I'm saying is true, okay, in your own study. But I want to submit to you and suggest to you that there's two signals in these trumpets, and there's two kinds of trumpets. One of the trumpets is for Israel. No replacement theology here. What's replacement theology? Replacement theology is that the church replaces Israel as God's elect. And this gets people in a lot of trouble, especially when it comes to eschatology. What's eschatology? The study of end times events. You're getting a Bible college course right here. (laughs) Crash course. So listen, eschatology is a study of last day's events, end times events. Now, if you replace Israel with the church, then you put the church in the tribulation. Don't do that. Don't put us in the tribulation. We don't belong there. It's not the time of the church's trouble. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, when God renamed him, it's not the time of the church's trouble. It's the time of Israel's trouble. It's the 70th week of Daniel, that seven-year period of time. We're not in the tribulation. We cannot be in the tribulation. Now, if you replace Israel with the church, then, ha, see ya. 
wouldn't want to be ya. You could go through the tribulation. I have no interest in going through the tribulation. I, <laughs> I'm waiting for that trumpet to sound because I know when that trumpet sounds in the twinkling of an eye, an immeasurable amount of time, we will be like him, given our glorified bodies, which I don't know about you, but <laughs> please, Lord, come quickly. <laughs> I mean, this body got some miles on it. <laughs> so you've got a second trumpet, and you've got a different trumpet with a second signal, and it's found in Numbers the 10th chapter, verses 1 through 7. Let me just read it for you real quickly. Now, the Lord said to Moses, make two trumpets hammered of hammered silver. Silver is in typology a picture of redemption. And use them for calling the community together and for having the camps set out. When both are sounded, the whole community is to assemble before you at the entrance to the tent of meeting, which was the tabernacle, if only one is sounded, the leaders, the heads of the clans of Israel, are to assemble before you. When a trumpet, trumpet blast is sounded, the tribes camping on the east are to set out. At the sounding of a second blast, the camps on the south are to set out. The blast will be the signal for setting out to gather the assembly, blow the trumpets, but not with the same signal. The church is not the same as Israel. This still has its fulfillment in Israel. But see, with the birth of the church and the church age, you now have one of these trumpet sounds, one of these trumpet signals to gather God's uh, people, the bride of Christ, to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so too does another trumpet gather Israel together. Now, if you're taking notes or if you want the handout, this is going to be key in, in, to your understanding of the distinction as you delineate the difference between these two trumpets, okay? I told you you're going to need to put your thinking cap on. First of all, you have the last trumpet, which is for us, and you have the first trumpet, which is for Israel, two different trumpets. Now, the last trumpet for us is in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 52, the first trumpet for Israel is Exodus 19, verses 16 through 17. Again, to gather God's people. Now, the last trumpet is not the seventh trumpet in Revelation 10, 7, which happens at the middle of the tribulation, but which, by the way, what happens at the middle of the tribulation? That's right. Israel realizes, you know what? This Christ that we've embraced is the Antichrist. He's not our Messiah. And they come to a saving knowledge of the true Christ. For the last half of the th uh, tribulation, for the last three and a half years, they flee to Petra. The whole house of Israel gets saved. Again, that's the purpose of the tribulation, right? What You guys know the song. <laughs> the purpose of the tribulation for the salvation of the Jewish nation. Everybody now. <laughs> That's the purpose of the tribulation. It's for the salvation of the Jewish nation who will come to a saving knowledge of their true Messiah at the middle of the tribulation. When that trumpet, that seventh trumpet, the, the uh, trumpet sounds and Israel comes together and comes to Christ. But it's, and this is where replacement theology gets in trouble. It does not refer to the church. There's another trumpet for Israel, and that's why the Feast of Trumpets can have two meanings, two fulfillments prophetically in one person, the person of Jesus Christ. Exodus 19, uh, Thursday nights, we'll be uh, looking at this study. The first trumpet on the morning of the third day. Really? Uh, Hosea 6.2, interesting verse, after two days. Now, what do we know to be true about two days? Two days under the Lord is like 2,000 years for us. The Jews for 2,000 years now have been wandering, and on the third day, he will revive us, speaking of Israel, Hosea 6.2, and he will restore us that we may live in his presence. And what is the purpose of a trumpet sound? The purpose of a trumpet sound is to gather God's people. Israel is the wife of God. The church is the bride of Christ. Therein lies the difference and the distinction and the delineation, if you will. And so for, it was for Israel to meet the Lord. And again, this could possibly be the same as the first day of the seventh month. See, understand, we are 
about to enter into the first day of the 7,000th year. See, we're at that 6,000 years. Again, a 1,000 years is like one day. A 1,000 years for us is like one day, Peter says, for the Lord. So this first trumpet was for Israel, the last trumpet for us. Now, you have another distinction. Now, watch this. You have the trumpet of God or the trumpet of angels. The trumpet of God is for us. The trumpet of angels is for Israel. We find this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, where it says that the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ, you know, will rise first. That's a God sounding that trumpet. Well, with Israel, Matthew 24, verses 20 through 22, and then verse 31, it's not the trumpet of God, because it's not for us. It's the trumpet of angels, because it's for Israel. You see the distinction? Again, Numbers tells us there were two signals. There were two trumpets. One of those trumpets is for Israel, and one of those trumpets is for the church. And that's why I believe this feast has its fulfillment, not just in the church, but also for Israel as well. And you can do that. You don't have to replace Israel with the church to do that, to fulfill that. It's the voice of the archangel in 1 Thessalonians 4 with the trumpet call of God. This, again, is where replacement theology gets into it. Deep kimchi. (laughs) When they try to take that last trumpet of angels in Matthew 24, and when it says that God will uh, you know, gather his elect... Well, we're his elect, right? Yeah, but there's a distinction there. Again, it's the first trumpet for us, uh, first trumpet for Israel, last trumpet for us, trumpet of God for us, trumpet of angels for Israel. You have to make that distinction or you'll turn your eschatology into a pretzel and be so confused, you won't know which way is up. The rapture of the church of Jesus Christ can happen at any minute that trumpet can sound. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain will meet them in the air. You know, I love what the Apostle Paul said to the Thessalonian church when he said about the rapture, the rapture hasn't come yet. Understand, the Thessalonians thought the rapture, they thought they missed the rapture. How depressing is that? Could you imagine? <laughs> you know, in the mainland, we had daylight savings time. We don't have it in Hawaii, thank God. But over there, when I was pastoring, we would have, you know, three services at one time. We had three services. But we would have to set our clocks forward or, you know, spring forward or fall back. That was the only way I could remember it. Uh, you know, one hour. So <laughs> people would come to church and there's nobody there. They're like, I miss the rapture. No, Jesus, please. And, and then somebody starts showing up. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> That was the Thessalonian church. They thought they missed the rapture. That's why the Apostle Paul writes to this church two letters, says, guys, you didn't miss the rapture. (laughs) There's some things that you need to know about the rapture. Again, I think he was telling them, you not only need to know about, you know, that the rapture is going to happen, but you need to know why and when the rapture could happen in that it could happen at any minute. But he says in there that, about the rapture, after he describes the rapture, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then he says, I love these words, therefore, encourage each other with these words. Now stay with me, okay? For all you, uh, all your mid-trib, you know, b- f- Christian friends, okay? Uh, ask them this question. If, the, or even post-trib, ask them this question. Why would the Apostle Paul talk about the rapture and that when it happens, the dead in Christ will rise first, we who are alive and remain, we'll meet them in the air, and then after that say, therefore, encourage each other with these words. It doesn't fit anything but a pre-tribulation rapture. Can you imagine that? Uh, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, and it's a mid- or post-tribulation rapture. The dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up in the meat of the Lord and there. And then, but you're going to have to go through, a third of the earth's population is just going to be wiped out. Mountains will be plucked out and cast into the sea. Hailstones are going to be, I mean, that's not very encouraging to me. I can't, that doesn't encourage me. You mean I have to go through that first? 
<laughs> no, shoot me now. It doesn't fit. He's trying to encourage them that the rapture of the church will come before the seven-year tribulation. Again, the trumpets, you need to understand. You need to know why you believe what you believe. And I believe that this feast was given not just for Israel, but for us as well, because you have two trumpets. For us, it gathers us to meet the Lord in the air. For Israel, it gathers them to meet the Lord in the tribulation. While we're celebrating, they're going to be tribulating, as one has said.